arteries. We had veins with those arteries, but they had different names. We had the anterior endometrial arteries, like the great cardiac vein, um, and martial artery, but the small cardiac vein. So most of the arteries, we have subclavian artery, we have subclavian vein. Femoral artery, we have femoral vein. So most of the arteries are found with veins of the same name, um, but there are some that have a different pathway slightly. And so as you're studying the arteries, the better you know the arteries, the better, the easier the veins will be um, after that, except for the few key differences. So we may need to adjust our lecture exam. Um, keeping that in mind, I don't want to shortchange you on that. Um, because I have that, the, all those review slides that I want to work with you on as well. So we'll just keep that in mind. But again, there's no class or lab on Tuesday. Okay? I may post some additional material for you to work with um, to help you review that material on your own. But if you could schedule time for open lab on Monday, we won't have lab time on Tuesday uh, to supplement that. Okay? Again, we'll look at the schedule. The, exam time, I don't want to short change you. I don't have time to work on it. And some of you have other classes and work on Monday afternoon and can't do that. So I'm not trying to replace that with it. But if you can make it to open lab on Monday, um, that can keep you ahead of things, um, not just up with components. This slide um, comes right after our discussion on Tuesday of cardiac output. Anybody remember, it's not in your lecture notes, it's in the lab packet. Um, but it's kind of a summary of what we described with cardiac output. And again, we'll be looking at cardiac output next week when we talk about blood pressure control. Because cardiac output is one of the major factors affecting blood pressure. The other factor has to do with our blood vessels. So we're, um, one of the textbooks we use, and maybe Mario's or it may have been an earlier one, actually discusses blood pressure before the blood vessels, and that's difficult because blood vessel function and structure has the um, factor that has to do with changing blood pressure. So, anybody remember what our formula is for cardiac output? Heart rate, heart rate, heart rate times stroke volume. stroke volume. Okay? And heart rate, we talked about its regulation with the autonomic nervous system. It's also regulated uh, by arrhythmias, which can be affected by ions and so on. So we're going to look at that a little bit with part of our uh, physiology, pathophysiology. So down here at the bottom of the screen, the words are really small, okay? So this is not in your lecture notes, but it is online. And um, just as an aside, those uh, PowerPoints that looked at the funny channels, and I said the diagrams were more confusing than the words, that was not on the lecture notes are already up, so I just added it as a separate additional packet at the bottom of the PowerPoint lecture notes for that are on D2L for the heart. So it says funny channel diagrams or something like that if you want to go back and look at that list. But anyway, so here's cardiac output. So the two factors that are changing cardiac output are listed at the bottom, just above. So stroke volume and heart rate. Okay, so that's the two components of the formula that we're looking at. So the green line is increasing, the red line is decreasing. So we looked at heart rate first. So as we go back, anything that is going to affect heart rate is going to affect cardiac output. So parasympathetic is going to decrease. Sympathetic is going to increase. Right. So we back up from that. What are factors that are going to cause sympathetic to increase? Low blood pressure. Because obviously, if your blood pressure is low, you need to increase the cardiac output and you need to increase um, blood pressure. So that's going to increase the pathetic nervous system directly. And if low, there's low blood pressure, that's also going to cause um, blood vessels to constrict and other factors to increase venous return. The kidneys will stop excreting as much urine. So it's kind of just a map of what we talked about as we change in diastolic volume and in systolic volume or stroke volume. So these are just a general view at the factors that we covered that affect cardiac output, the heart rate versus the stroke volume. And again, when we do blood pressure, those same factors will affect systemic changes as well. So if we look at some additional factors, and these are listed on your lecture notes um, on page 64. So 
So epinephrine and norepinephrine we talked about on Thursday. Those are factors we've talked about twice now that affect the pacemaker cells, okay? Affecting heart rate, as well as the sympathetic affecting ventricular contraction via changes in what ions? What's the most important ion affecting ventricular contractile force? Calcium. Calcium. Okay. So um, that table that I told you you would see on the exam, if I said there's an increase in extracellular calcium, the effect on stroke volume would be an increase in stroke volume, right? Because there's a direct relationship in the force and number of myosin heads pulling on active. Thyroxin also increases heart rate. You guys recognize the word thyroxin? Mm -hmm. Thyroxin is a hormone from the thyroid gland, and it has a generalized effect by increasing the requirement for oxygen, by increasing the synthesis of ATP. So that also increases heart rate okay. by affecting the enzymes and the mitochondrial activity of the heart muscles as well. And over here are a list of some ions. And we'll talk about some of the ECG changes, especially for potassium. And we have a couple, two or three, four individuals working on the case study of uh, death by poison. Um, potassium chloride is often used to cause lethal in lethal injection components. It's the last part of the drug um, in uh, death penalties that causes the heart to stop. All right, so there's some ECG changes that we'll look at really briefly. Hypernatremia is really difficult to show up on the ECG. All right, it's really difficult to see ECG changes. But if you've been working on the Physio X component, you were changing some of the ions as well. Um, in that physio X component with the frog heart. And so remember when we were talking about the nervous system, the effect of calcium on sodium channels? An increase in calcium blocked voltage-gated sodium channels and inhibited nerve impulse uh, transduction. I was talking about my friend who takes Tums to keep from getting cramps, and it's more of a nerve activity suppression than it is a muscle component. And so um, in this case, Sodium affects calcium. There's a calcium exchange enzyme inside the contractile cells uh, that exchanges sodium for calcium ions. And so that can affect the calcium component. <coughs> Most of the ion changes, however, that the heart is sensitive to are potassium and calcium. And so if you look at, if I have an image here, this is a really simple one, so I'm going to leave that up there because I have a description of the changes here. Um, these vary in severity of hyperkalemia. I'm going to diagram uh, some of these on the board and emphasize some of these changes after the case study, but I want you to, if I put an ECG up there, I want you to be able to recognize it as hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. Ka or K is our ion. Um, Symbol for potassium. So the normal range um, is around, correct me here, Amy, if I'm remembering it incorrectly, 3.5 um, to 5 uh, milliequivalents. Because when we first start to see early changes in hyperkalemia, it's above 5.5 milliequivalents. All right, so, and they range from greater than 5.5 equivalents per liter to greater than nine. And greater than nine most often results in death. Okay, so you start to see these early changes um, and then you can, they get worse and worse and worse. So we start off with um, the early signs are wide, tall, and tinted T waves. So if you're looking at a typical, you see that instead of a normal flattened, uh, rounded T wave. And that has to do with the effect on hyperkalemia on the repolarization of the contractile cells. Right. So remember our action potential for a contractile cell? 
looks like this. And it's just sodium in flow, calcium in flow, potassium outflow, and potassium outflow here. So if we have a lot of potassium outside the cell, all right, it's going to affect the, the repolarization activity of the heart and causes this shorter, um, highly pointed T wave. Then it starts to affect the atrial depolarization. And so the P wave becomes flatter and then almost completely absent as it affects the flow of current through the atria. And also, it's affecting the ability of the SA node to fire. So that's the last event that I'm going to show you. Um, so as this gets worse, we, can ha we have an absent P wave, all right? We have a really wide QRS, and then a peaked T wave. You can see from a normal um, ECG, how that changes. Almost difficult to tell the difference between the QRS and the T wave. And then as we get higher and higher here, we end up with what's called a sinus. These things just kind of roll into each other. And then ventricular fibrillation, where we just completely lose ability. And so we start to affect the conduction through the heart, and we get arrhythmias as well. Okay. Um, the smaller absent P waves, start to be reflected. Remember how, why the pacemakers, the pacemaker potential occurs. We get to hyperpolarization and then we start repolarization as the funny channels are opened at the lower negative charge. If we have potassium outside, we're going to kind of hover within this range here, not high enough to reach the threshold, but not low enough to open the funny channels. So we start losing the ability of the pacemaker cells to reach a threshold. So there's a whole range of effects uh, that occur with hyperkalemia, from the pacemaker cells to the contractile cells, all right, that we start to see some early changes, and then it can be so bad as to completely block both pacemaker potential, action potential, and transduction through the, through the heart itself. Okay. Hypokalemia is not as common as hyperkalemia. Now, we haven't done all of the systems, obviously, since we're only in the sixth week of class. But what system of the body do you think is most commonly affecting, or problems, pathophysiology is going to most commonly affect potassium levels? Kidneys. Kidneys. All right. So because the kidneys balance sodium loss and potassium, um, that renal problems is the most common cause of potassium change levels. Or if someone, this can also occur, and this is for free, I'm not gonna test you on these specific things yet. Um, someone who's in congestive heart failure might be given diuretics as a way of decreasing venous return, and diuretics can throw off uh, potassium components. All right, so the heart is one of the, the potassium channels I've been talking about. There's actually different potassium channels. There are potassium channels here that are different than these potassium channels. And they'll open and close in response to different components. So if you go into nursing and you work in a coronary care unit, you'll get a whole, a whole bunch of training after nursing just dealing with these components. Okay? So you'll go, I don't remember that, and it's because I never talked about it. But at least you should have a, a basis understanding for the channels that are involved. All right, so looking at some other conditions um, that affect the cardiovascular system, we haven't talked about um, blood vessels yet, but these can affect systemic blood vessels as well as coronary blood vessels. So my father-in-law, um, who passed away last spring, um, had a triple coronary bypass and then about 10 years later, a double coronary bypass and two stent placements. Um, he actually had his first one when he was about 64. 
and he died that spring at the age of 87 um, with heart problems genetic in his, both sides of his family mom's side and his dad's side yes uncle died of heart failure um, and his mother died of congestive heart failure but she was in her 90s um, and so medical support helped him uh, to overcome a lot of these aspects atherosclerosis is a uh, process of the deposition of adipose tissue, but not on the surface of the blood vessels. So the blood is not in con direct contact with the adipose cells, with the adipose sites. What actually happens is they get underneath the endothelium, the simple squamous epithelium lining the blood vessels, and get deposited in the smooth muscle of the wall, which then bulges out into the blood vessel and narrows the blood vessel. So these have to do with the bad, like with this, the LDLs, all right? The LDLs are associated with this uptake into um, smooth muscle cells. So that's going to narrow the blood vessel and decrease blood supply if it's in the coronary artery, decrease blood supply obviously to the heart. If it's in systemic vessels, typically arteries over veins, it's going to affect blood pressure. Congestive heart failure. I mentioned this. We talked about this as a result of different changes. So remember, I parked on this. Blood pressure is different. We have two different ventricles because we have two different circuits, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. Same volume out of both left and right ventricles, but different pressures. So if one side of the heart starts to fail, it's weaker, it's not able to contract and create as great a contractility. So remember the Frank Sterling law we talked about? So as it's stretched out, it doesn't come back quite as far. And so we end up with the greater volume, a greater in systolic volume. And what would increase, preload or afterload first? Wait, in that situation? Yeah. Well, let me change the question. <laughs> what would be the greatest factor in leading to congestive heart failure? The change in preload or the change in afterload? Absolutely. Afterload. Because that's the work that the heart has to start to get the blood flowing through the semilunar valves. And if it starts to become weak as a result of having to do that much extra work, it's just kind of a vicious cycle. Um, it has extra work to do, so it gets weak. And then it has less force, and it, the ventricle enlarges and it gets even weaker. So, what I want to look at here briefly is what happens between right-sided and left-sided congestive heart failure. So we look at right-sided congestive heart failure. We're looking at the right ventricle. Okay. The right ventricle receives blood, the oxygenated blood, from the systemic vessels, via Ardena Cobbins. So if it's weak, is there going to be a problem in front of the right ventricle, blood coming in, or is there going to be a problem downstream from the right ventricle? Is there a problem going to be in the systemic system or the pulmonary system? Pulmonary. So here's the heart. right ventricle is weak, so it's not pumping as much blood to the pulmonary mm -hmm. trunk. So blood is going to increase, our in -systolic volume, in -systolic volume is going to increase as this becomes weaker and dilated. So where is pressure going to back up? In Into the right atrium. So pressure is going to back up here as there's less blood going up here. Then it's going to back up into the superior vena cava and it's going to back up into the inferior vena cava. As it backs up into that, it's going to reach smaller veins, and then it's going to reach systemic capillaries. All right? So we have a blockage or a weakness in the right ventricle, 
we're going to see a increase in blood pressure upstream. I think that makes more sense to you than saying proximal. So eventually, that increase in blood pressure reaches the capillaries. Remember, we're going backwards. So it's going to back up in the superior and inferior vena cava. It's going to back up in the smaller veins. And then pressure is going to increase in the capillaries. Yeah, so because the right ventricle is weak, it can't take in a lot of blood? Is that what's Well, not that it can't take in. It can't pump out. Oh, it can't pump so let's out. say we normally have 135 mils mm -hmm. as our end diastolic volume. And we normally have 70 mils as our stroke volume. That leaves us an in systolic volume of 65. But let's say that we have a weaker heart, all right? So instead of pumping out 70, it's going to pump out 50. So our inside diastolic volume is going to be 85. But it can still only pump out, now that it's stretched, we're going to have a little bit of Frank starting well. But instead of pumping out as much as it should, it only pumps out 60. So now we have an end systolic volume of, but more has come in. All right, so we add another, we add another um, 70 to that, and we have 155, but we're only pumping out 50 or 60, so now our end diastolic volume is 100. Our brain cystic volume is 100. So because it's weak, more and more blood, now I'm making it dramatic over from one cycle to the next. More and more blood is remaining in the right ventricle. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there's a limit to how much you can actually stretch. Okay. So it starts to back up into the right atria because it can't come into the right ventricle. There's already blood there because it hasn't left. And then that backs up into the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. And then that backs up farther downstream into the veins and small capillaries. So as we'll see today, capillaries have only one layer and that's an epithelium and a loose connective tissue. The epithelium is simple squamous. So as we see in our capillary system here, increased hydrostatic pressure, increased blood pressure is going to increase fluid loss across the capillary wall. That's edema. That increased fluid ends up in the interstitial extracellular fluid, and we end up with we have increased fluid loss, and that increases provides systemic edema. So if you're on your feet all day, all right, like I am when I'm teaching, fortunately I'm not just standing in one place. If I wear socks. I am now with my boots. When I get home tonight, there will be an indentation above my ankle where my socks were. The so socks have a slight compression. And gravity, I have more fluid volume in my lower extremities. And being on my feet all day, gravity increases that. If I were to lie in bed all day and wear socks at the end of the day, you wouldn't see that indentation from the socks. All right? So that, other than when I wake up in the morning, that's gone. Women who are pregnant with the weight of the fetus and the growing uterus on the inferior vena cava block some of that venous return, especially if they lie on the wrong side in, in bed, and you'll see they're complaining about their feet swelling. All right, so that's systemic edema. It typically shows in the lower extremities before you see it um, in the hands, but clubbing of the fingers can be an indication of heart failure because it's a form of systemic edema. Question? Okay, so that's right-sided. So to differentiate between right-sided and left-sided, you want to go backwards. You want to go upstream. And that's where the failure is going to be. So I told some of you, when my oldest son was um, a couple years ago, and around this time, actually, it was March, um, he got, got a sore throat, went to the student center at his, his school, his college, and they tested for strep throat, said, no, you don't have strep throat. Uh, so about, that was Monday. Friday, he was in the dorm uh, getting a shower. And his heart started palpating really fast and palpitating. And he saw red. 
and the next thing you knew was waking up face down in the shower. And so I think, well, okay, fine, hot shower, drops blood pressure, but a heart rapid heart and the seeing red would have been an elevated blood pressure. Uh, so he got up, went back to his dorm, his room, and started feeling faint again. And uh, so his roommate, who didn't have a driver's license, drove him in his car 15 minutes down the hill to the local hospital, emergency room. There's no coverage. There's barely any coverage at the school. No coverage at the hospital. So we found out about it about four hours later when he posted on Facebook in the emergency room a picture of himself sitting in bed with all the electrodes on. <laughs> so we're you know, texting back and forth via Facebook. And uh, Polly said, well, why don't you call my doctor? So at 9.30 that night, I talked to his doctor. And his doctor said, now, you know, I don't want you to worry about him. We did, I, I'm thinking he might have a pulmonary embolism. <coughs> so we did a scan. And um, his scan showed an enlarged inferior vena cava and enlarged hepatic veins. So instantly I knew that was a sign of right-sided congestive heart failure because you're backing up inferior vena cava, the next, the last veins to empty into the inferior vena cava are the hepatic veins from the liver. So he said, now, I don't want you to worry. We treat 21st century heart problems with 21st century medicine. Uh, we're going to um, admit them overnight, do a stress test in the morning. And so my husband and I drove down the next morning to check them out and bring them home. And he had already had hints of heart problems, so his entire life it's been a niggling question in the back of my mind. As a two-year-old, a doctor, a friend that we know, is playing with them and looked up and said, you've had Chris's heart checked out, haven't you? And I had been to all his pediatric appointments and everything, so I just said, yeah. I didn't even ask her, why are you asking? Six months later, we were at a water six flights park in Atlanta, um, and he, I had to take him to the bathroom, and he was trying to have a bowel movement and couldn't, and his entire mouth turned a dark purple all the way around from the straining of the Valsalva maneuver. And that would happen to a small degree when he got a cold, when he got a bath, he just got cold. So my sister, who's... Uh, used to be a pediatric heart transplant nurse, and we got back to her house an hour and a half later, a drive north. She said, let me listen to his heart. And she said, come over here and listen to this. And his heart was going, boom, 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 I mean, it was so irregular, it was completely noticeable. And most young kids, if they're not getting enough oxygen, if they have heart problems, they'll run around playing and they'll sit and they'll just squat for a while. It's a telltale sign of something going wrong with their heart. He'd never done that. She said, you need to have them checked out when you get back. So after Labor Day, uh, we were back in this, back here, and I made an appointment. Didn't say what it was, um, but the doc, they had to cancel for whatever reason. It was a week later. I had done research. He had a cold, so I had done research on the trimenic, pediatric trimenic, which is off the market now. And after four hours, found that it could cause premature ventricular heart contractions, early um, ventricular contractions. So I stopped the medication. By the time he saw the doctor, he was fine. I told him what had happened. And the doctor said, you used to be an RN, you worry too much, he's fine. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, it's still in the back of my mind. The kid's still an infant. His freshman year of college, he's at Sac City, trying out for the basketball team, and he failed his physical um, with high blood pressure. So and he had had a headache previous to that. So he went to check the, the high blood pressure out. And this is where the ischemic, uh, cardiac ischemic headache case study comes from. It's in your, in your case study list. And the doctor said, your blood pressure is fine. You know, it's probably stressed trying to get from Folsom Lake down to Sac City in 40 minutes without getting a ticket. Um, but then he noticed that Chris had come in with headaches after exercise during the exercise as well. I'm not going to clear you until you go and get a stress test. Well, by then, they figured out, so he missed the basketball component. But his stress test came out normal. But again, all of this is kind of in the back of my mind when the ER doctor says, I've seen these signs on his, on his um, x-rays uh, and uh, his uh, CAT scans and stuff. So the next morning when we picked him up, the doctor that checked him out said, OK, he's fine. Stress test was normal. I said, well, what about the enlarged heart? And I gave us, uh, there's nothing in the radiology report about this. So I said, well, that's what the ER doctor told me. 
Significantly, the ER doctor said, when he said, don't worry about 21st century heart problems, had just checked his own son out that same day from having open heart surgery. Um, we brought Chris home. He could barely swallow. Every time we stopped, he'd open the door to spit. And I said, well, honey, he'd been holding his jaw, his right side of his jaw on his neck when we came to this hospital room. If it had been his left side, I would have thought heart problems. I just said, did you fall on your face? Because I thought, you know, he hit his jaw. And he said, no. Um, he said, you know, my, my throat hurts. And so on the way home, I said, well, what did the doctor say about your sore throat? He goes, they never looked at it. And I said, well, did you tell them you had a sore throat? And he said, yeah, but they never looked at it. So the next morning, I looked, and he had this huge tonsil, took him to urgent care. They almost called an ambulance because they were afraid it was so large it was going to block his throat. Took him to Sutter General. They took out 15 cc's of pus from a tonsil abscess. So we got an $18,000 charge from the hospital in St. Helena that our health insurance refused to pay because it was the wrong diagnosis. I don't know why he fainted. So we ended up spending the night at Sutter General for observation after they um, removed the abscess. So, you know, there's a but. It was because of my knowledge of congestive heart failure that when he sat, there's an enlarged inferior vena cava and enlarged hepatic vein that is upstream of the right side of the heart. You go farther than that, you start to see, you know, the systemic edema. If the problem is the liver and not the heart, all right, you have portal hypertension, which we'll talk about when we get to the digestive system, then you have the systemic edema, but you start to see the enlarged veins in the abdominal tissue, esophageal, varicosities, and bleeding because the blood pressure can uh, cause those to rupture. So I want you to figure out systemic edema is right side. That's where the blood's coming from, from the ventricle. All right, where's the blood coming from if we're looking at the left side? It's coming back from the lungs. So we have left sided, it's receiving blood from pulmonary. Pulmonary vessels. Pulmonary veins. And so if the left side is weak, then blood's going to back up into the left atrium. Another cause of this can be mitral stenosis. Remember the mitral valve is another name for the um, left atrioventricular valve. But that doesn't close completely because of narrowing or thickening of the valve leaflets, which can occur as a result of bacterial infections. Then you can see how blood would return to the left atrium when the ventricle contracts and then can leak back and that could also cause uh, left sided congestive heart failure. From there it's going to back up into the pulmonary veins. From there it's going to back up into pulmonary capillaries. Pulmonary capillaries surround the alveoli of the lungs. So we have blood, fluid rather, water leaking out of the pulmonary capillaries. So just going into, into intracellular, extracellular fluid, it's going to go into the um, alveoli. So you're going to end up with air sacs, with fluid, which obviously is going to decrease the um, amount of oxygen that can diffuse into the blood over because we're increasing diffusion distance. And this is pulmonary edema. Okay. So right sided is systemic edema. Left sided is pulmonary edema. So what would you expect to be two prongs of the major treatment for congestive heart failure? What do we need to do? Lower blood pressure. Lower blood pressure, and how do we do that? We need to strengthen the heart, but we at the same time we need to lower blood pressure. So blood pressure, yes, drugs, but we need to decrease venous return by lowering volume. So often with congestive heart failure, these individuals are put on a salt-restrictive diet 
and are given diuretics to increase urine output. Decreasing venous return and decreasing stroke volume. But at the same time, we need to increase the force of the heart because the heart is weak. That's why they're in congestive heart failure anyway. So drugs are given to increase contractile force. And one of the most common types are digitalis versions, which increases the stroke volume but actually lowers heart rate by affecting the autonomic nervous system indirectly. So we increase stroke volume and that aids the heart. So if we have a weak heart and we help increase the amount of calcium ions with each stroke, more of that blood can be moved out. So by decreasing the venous return and then increasing the force, we can help the heart overcome the backup of blood. So we're affecting, remember, cardiac output is determined by heart rate and stroke volume. And with stroke volume, that's determined by venous return and contractility primarily. So that's what drugs are doing. Okay, myocardial infarction is our fancy term for heart attack. It's not just ischemia. All right? Ischemia is just the lack of oxygen to the tissues without them actually dying. So they can, they can have pain, angina, but not actual death. All right? So because of the lack of good anastomoses between the vessels, if there's a blockage in the coronary arteries or near branches, then you're going to see a lack of oxygen to the tissues. And it can happen from a clot or it can happen from a gradual narrowing. Um, and then when there is death of the ventricular muscle usually is when we see this, heart attacks don't have to result in death because it depends on how much of the area, it will change an ECG. Anybody remember what the key, the easiest thing to see in a ECG of a myocardial infarction because of the change in conduction. <clears throat> Easiest change to see, now if it's affecting you know, the AB node, you're going to see it there. But the most, as far as we're concerned, without going into an ECG class, you have an elevated, whoops, an elevated ST segment. So instead of the S doing this and the T wave doing that, you're going to have a P wave and then an elevated S and T segment. Okay? It's taking longer. Because it has to get around. That area is not, so it's taking longer for the conduction area to get back around through the heart tissue. So the elevated ST segment, that's listed on the list, um, list of ECGs earlier in the lecture notes. But just to remind you of that while we're talking about it. Now, in left-sided and right-sided congestive heart failure, it's usually not because of a myocardial infarct. Um, it can be congenital. It can be a viral infection damaging the heart tissue. Okay. This is just showing a heart with damaged tissue. So this is the area. Obviously, this person isn't alive anymore because their heart's not in their body. <laughs> But this is the area of infarct. Okay, blue baby. Blue baby. There usually is a question on the exam asking for you to list a cause or causes of a blue baby. And the term blue baby is because the babies appear gray and cyanotic because they have insufficient oxygen binding to their hemoglobin. So any problem that interferes with the oxygenation of a baby's blood is going to result in a blue baby. Okay. So we're going to look at some different, uh, usually congenital defects, things that they're born with, that can result in a blue baby. All right. So one is patent ductus arteriosus. Now next week we'll talk about, um, not what's going to be Wednesday, but I mean Tuesday, but now it'll be Thursday, talk about venal circulation. But remember, we talked about the fact that when blood returns to the fetal heart from the umbilical vein of the mother, and it gets into the 
right ventricle. As it comes in the right ventricle, it's directed through the foramen ovale and to the left atrium. Some blood, especially from the superior vena cable, will go out the pulmonary trunk. And it has the last chance to not go to the, pulmon to the fetal lungs by going through the ductus arteriosus. After the baby's born and pressure in the lungs drops, that becomes the preferred pathways to go through the pulmonary trunk because the pressure is lower in the lungs than it is before the baby is born. So it doesn't go through the foramen ovale and it doesn't go through the ductus arteriosus and those usually close within one to three days after birth. Right? If they remain open, then we have blood from the pulmonary trunk that now that the baby is born is deoxygenated. And it will go into the aorta and add deoxygenated blood back to the um, arterial blood, resulting in less um, oxygenated blood. Or on the pressure, um, some of the oxygenated blood will leave, but there's a mixing, either patent ductus ovale or patent ductus arteriosus is a mixing of that blood. Or we can have problems with the septa. So if it's a patent foramen ovale, remember that's found in the interatrial septum. So if that remains open, that's what's being shown here. So again, right-sided deoxygenated blood would go into the left side and not get to the lungs and therefore mix. Or there can be ventricular septal defects. So when the ventricles contract, there is a mixing of blood between the right and the left ventricles. So not all of the blood uh, ends up being oxygenated. Now, that can occur separately. It can occur in the muscular septum or in the membranous septum up here. Because the endocardial cushions, when they form those walls of the chambers, did completely meet. And so the babies are viable. Right? They're not going to die um, immediately after birth, but they're not going to have an adequate oxygen, and so they'll have this cyanotic color. If not at birth, when they start to move around and walk, they, they may have to become, be tired and not do as much, um, depending on the size of the opening and the amount of mixing of blood. And then there's a combination. This is known as the tetralogy of fellow. Remember our tetras with embryonic um, oogenesis and spermatogenesis? Tetra refers to the number four. So tetralogy of fellow are four defects that occur. Again, these are congenital defects that occur together. So here we have a septal defect in the membranous portion of the um, interventricular septum. And... <laughs> Therefore, the overriding aorta refers to the fact that it's kind of in the center. So when the ventricles contract, blood from the left right ventricle can go into, that's what these blue dots are showing, can go into the aorta as well as into the pulmonary trunk. Increasing that aspect is a narrowing of the pulmonary valve. So it makes it, and the, and the pulmonary trunk itself, so that makes it more difficult for the blood to go through and therefore it gets shifted over to the uh, left side. And because it's more difficult for blood to go through, the right ventricle is having to work harder. And so you see this thickening of the right ventricular wall. And, but the primarily blue baby effect is because of the addition of deoxygenated blood to the aorta. So surgery involves obviously closing the defect and then usually several surgeries to widen the pulmonary trunk. And then we have complete reversal, transposition. So in this case, the aorta was still coming out of the left ventricle, but with that opening, we had a mixture of blood. In this case, there's trans transposition of the great vessels. So you'll see that the aorta actually is coming out of the right ventricle, and the, superior, the pulmonary trunk is coming out of the left. Now notice in this diagram, there is a septal defect. That's the only thing keeping this baby alive. 
and I told you about this, the 15-year-old um, that came to visit the class four or five years ago, he had this condition but without the septal defect. So he had to have surgery immediately, all right? Because as soon as the umbilical cord was cut, he had no ability of the blood from his lungs that would be coming back to the pulmonary veins of getting to the rest of his body. Without a septal defect, that blood wouldn't mix, and he had two completely separate circuits. So left ventricle was pumping to lungs, returning to left atrium, pumping back to the lungs, returning to left atrium. In this case, with the septal defect, that oxygenated blood can be pumped over to this side, and at least some of it get out to the body. Okay. So that septal defect, while it's a defect, is required for this baby to need to be able to exist before surgery. <coughs> there and take a break. When we come back, um, we're going to look at the next packet. If you haven't picked it up, it's over there on the side. And we'll start looking at the structure of blood vessels. Is there anybody that still wanted to do ETGs today? Can everybody get it done? Want to do it? Okay, so I'll pull that out. And then um, lab today is going to, if you want to work on the ETG some more, you can do that. Um, but start looking at the anatomy of the blood vessel description. So after we talk about the structure of blood vessels, we'll um, look at the aorta and its branches. We won't finish that today, but um, we'll do about halfway through that. Is the artery, and we would start off with, I'm going to get a little bit more detail here. We would have the aorta. or pulmonary trunk, but we'll just assume that the structure is similar. And then from that, we go to elastic arteries. The aorta has sheets of elastic fibers in it. That's what we were talking about. That is, the stroke volume enters the aorta. It stretches out the walls of the aorta. And then those elastic sheets on recoil help to continue to move the blood. So these are also known as conducting arteries. And then as we move farther away from the heart, uh, blood pressure is dropping. And arteries going to specific organs are now described as muscular arteries. They lose the elastic sheets. And these are also known as distributing arteries. And then they get smaller, and we just get smaller and smaller arteries. They would all be muscular arteries, but they're just getting smaller and smaller branches. And finally, we start to lose a significant amount of the smooth muscle wall, and arterioles are formed. Arterioles are significant. We'll go over them in just a moment, but I'll put it up here. They have only one to two layers of smooth muscle, by definition. And that makes them the most um, important vessels in blood pressure regulation. Because they're small, diameter, there's lots of them. All right? And because they still have smooth muscle, they can constrict and dilate. So the number of blood vessels and the, uh, the number of arterioles is significant because of surface area. And the fact that they can constrict and dilate makes them capable of responding to changes in requirement for increased or decreased blood pressure. So obviously the greatest surface area is going to be in the capillaries, but they don't have any smooth muscle whatsoever, and so they're not going to be able to constrict or dilate in requirement changes for blood pressure. So we lose all of that smooth muscle, and we have our capillaries. So each of these vessels is going to have a lower pressure 
than the upstream one because if it didn't, we wouldn't have blood flow. Remember, blood flow is still high pressure to low pressure. After we have gas exchange and nutri nutrient exchange, and that occurs in the capillaries because of their uh, thin wall structure, capillaries start to join together and form post-capillary venules. Post-capillary venules are significant because this is where we have diapodesis. They look like capillaries, but they're larger in diameter because more capillaries, they're, they're, they join together to form post-capillary venules. You guys remember what post what diapodesis is? You remember the word? Isn't that when the um, part of your immune system is able to squeeze through the blood vessels? Uh, not so much immune, it's defense. Because immune is specifically to lymphocytes. But you are correct, it's squeezing through. So in the post-capillary venules, um, in response to an inflammatory um, activity or invasion by pathogens, white blood cells are capable of changing shape and squeezing out through gaps between the epithelial lining of these vessels. So they don't have smooth muscle either, but they're larger and more permeable than the capillaries. And so this is the site where white blood cells would exit to get to a site of an infection. That's what we talked about in Bio 430. When we talked about skin and inflammatory response and uh, wound healing. So that this is diapodesis. Mm -hmm. and that occurs in the post-capillary venules. Then these regain muscle. And we have just regular venules. A smooth muscle is added to the wall. And then venules join together to form small veins and larger veins and our vena cava. Okay. In our small veins and larger veins, these are distinctive, as we'll see when we look at characteristics of vessel walls. Um, pressure in relationship to arteries, remember, is lower. So it's not a matter whether it contains oxygen or not. So in after a baby is born, the pulmonary veins are the only ones that are oxygenated, and the pulmonary arteries are the only ones that are deoxygenated. But remember, we call them arteries or veins because of the direction of blood flow. Arteries are away from the heart. Veins are returning to the heart. And so they're under lower pressure. So blood pressure is going to be higher in the capillaries than it is going to be in the vena cava. Otherwise, blood would continue to flow back to the heart. To keep that blood flowing towards the heart, even under gravitational um, contradiction to that pressure, we have the addition of valves. So veins are distinctive in addition to the changes in their wall structure because they have valves. So that's the sequence of how blood flows. And the many of those terms you're already familiar with. Now, before we move on to looking at specific um, components, I want to remind you of a factor that remember the same amount of blood that's going out of the heart has to come back into the heart, or we get congestive heart failure um, responses. So in the single aorta, if we do a cross-section of the aorta, all right, so a cross-section of the aorta versus a cross-section of all the capillaries, versus the cross-section, say, of the larger veins, the blood volume in each of these, in total, is going to be equal. So that one cross-section of the aorta, the volume in here, has to be equal to all the volume in the capillaries, 
has to be equal to all the volume in the veins at any particular location. So if I draw a line across here, I have the same volume here as I do here, same volume here as I do here. Otherwise, we would have a different amount of blood returning to the heart. What's the difference? Surface area. Right? The more blood vessels we have, even though volume is the same, the greater the surface area. We'll come back to this again with blood pressure. What do you think is happening to flow rate? What do you mean? So the, the volume per minute of blood flowing through one section of the aorta versus the volume per minute of one capillary. It's not the same. The volume, we have the same volume overall, but a greater number of vessels, right? So within each individual vessel, the flow rate is going to be slower. So what happens if you have five creek, a creek streams flowing together into a single channel? That single channel, the flow is going to be faster. Okay. So we're going to come back to those characteristics as we look at the effect of blood pressure. So typically, not true in my mother's case, um, she's about 150 pounds overweight, her blood pressure is lower than my dad, who's at his normal weight. But typically, as you increase body mass, be it muscles or adipose tissue, you increase the number of blood vessels, you increase the force of the heart to push the blood through all those blood vessels because of the increase of surface area and the resistance of the blood flowing and bumping against the vessel wall. So that's what happens with the arterioles. We have a greater number of arterioles, therefore there's a greater surface area, but we can constrict and dilate them so we still have control over the blood pressure. Capillaries have an even greater amount of surface area, but they don't have blood vessel, they don't have smooth muscle. We can't change their diameter, so we can't change the blood pressure response. What's that? The more blood vessels we have, the, um, the more we increase surface area to allow blood to go back to the heart.
Tunica media. And a Tunica externa or adventitia. And those are the three layers that we find in all the vessels except the capillary and the post-capillary venule. So this is a little bit um, better picture here of the two. So this innermost layer right here, you can see kind of maybe in the front, maybe not so much in the back, there's a dark purple line here. That's actually not the simple squamous epithelium, but a thick band of elastic uh, sheets of fibers that's present in our smaller arteries. So here's another diagram. Uh, that shows those three layers and compares them from artery to vein. So let's go through, first of all, what each layer is formed of and then how it compares um, in the most basic of each of the vessels. So the tunica intima is formed of simple squamous epithelium. And this is known, remember what we called the lining of the heart, which was simple squamous epithelium and loose irregular connective tissue, lining the heart chambers and covering the valves. Endocardium. The endocardium. All right, so this is tunica intima in the blood vessels, same type of tissue. The epithelium itself is also given the name of endothelium. So just the simple squamous epithelium lining the blood vessels is the endothelium. Oh, okay. Right. Now, in our muscular arteries, which is what you're seeing here, the distributing arteries, there is also a sheet of elastic. Not just a single elastic fiber, but a sheet of elastic fibers. So if I diagram this on the board, let's see I use green for epithelium in the heart. So we would have our simple squamous epithelium, the little dots of the nuclei, that's about the only thing that bulges out. We would have loose. regular connective tissue. And then in the muscular arteries, we would have a sheet of elastic fiber. And this is kind of weak, uh, kind of in waves because of the recoil. And this is known as the internal Elastic lamina. Lamina means layer. Okay. So again, in muscular arteries. The distributing arteries. because it's not in the tunica intima of every blood vessel. And then you can, you can see here how it kind of makes the lining of this muscular artery appear corrugated, highly folded. Okay. So that's shown right here, this pink line just on the inside here. The next layer it's the tunica media. And what was the middle layer of the heart and the middle layer of the uterus formed of? Myo. Myo, the muscle, so myocardium or myometrium. And so this middle layer is, we don't use the term myo, but it's still muscle. So the tunica media in all of our blood vessels, be it arteries or veins, is formed of smooth muscle. The orientation of the smooth muscle differs between arteries and veins, all right? 
So in all cases, the smooth muscle is oriented primarily so that the, long, the longitudinal axis of the muscle is oriented in a circular fashion around the vessel. So remember our smooth muscle is fusiform, wide in the middle, which allows it to form sheets. And that's oriented around the vessel wall. So in a cross section in the microscope, we can see this longitudinal orientation of the muscle. What would appear in, in a longitudinal section of the vessel? In a cross section of the vessel, the smooth muscle is cut longitudinal. Does that make sense? You see the longitudinal, the length of the muscle cell? If we were to cut the muscle, the vessel lengthwise, and the muscle cells are going in this direction, we would cut the cells in cross section. So what we would see in cross section instead of this would be various diameters of the smooth muscle cells. forming the wall, put in our endothelium here, and that's because we're cutting it this way. So we're cutting a cross section through the muscle cell. Why, is there, why do we have different diameters of the smooth muscle cell? Kind of different. Right, so the cell is fusiform shape. The nucleus here, so if we cut it in different locations, we're going to get different diameters. So in a cross section of the vessel, we have this variation in the cell diameter itself. Alright? Arteries, as I indicated to you already, are going to have a large amount of smooth muscle in proportion to the lumen of the blood vessel because of the higher force that they're trying to resist. And in conducting, in the aorta and in the conducting arteries, the elastic arteries, we have sheets of elastic fibers in between the muscle cells. So again, I'll put that in parentheses. Sheets of elastic fibers. in the aorta, and in elastic or conducting arteries, what's closest to the heart. So remember our heart models, we have the aorta coming out and the three first branches coming off the top of the aorta, okay, or our coronary arteries. Um, these are going to be in muscular arteries. 2As is my symbol, plural for arteries. All right, so that's this layer right here, and this dark blue is showing the elastic fibers. So typically when we talk about the presence of elastic fibers, they were present as a sheet in connective tissue. Here we see sheets of elastic fibers in the blood vessel wall. There is a congenital condition uh, where there's a defect in the enzymes producing a certain elastic protein. And these individuals, it's called Marfan syndrome. This is just for free. Um, where they lack significant amounts of elastic tissue and their aorta can tear because it doesn't have this ability to stretch. Um, they have misshapen eyeballs. Um, the problems with the ligaments are often very tall people, but they can have heart problems. They're often recruited for basketball, but they can have heart problems because of the lack of um, healthy elastic fibers in the aorta. And then just outside of that now, we have the tunica externa or adventitia, which is dense irregular connective tissue. the tissues that it's going through. 
in our being in Cabot, the tunnel at Edmonticia can get so large that it actually has its own blood supply. And you'll see tiny little blood vessels passing through the tunica adventitia. And these are identified as the blood vessels of the vessels. Has a kind of cool Latin name. The vats of the sore. Vessels of the vessels. And that's in the larger veins that we see that. I have a colleague at Sac State that calls them vas of a zoom. Let's get this picture of a motorcycle running through the aorta, through the veins. All right, so characteristically then, distinctions are the elastic or aorta will have the sheets of elastic fibers in the tunica media. Um, there is another elastic sheet I don't really test you on, but just to be accurate, there's another external elastic lamina out here that separates the tunica media from the tunica externa. But the internal elastic lamina is unique primarily to muscular arteries. When we get to tunica media, the difference between arteries and veins is distinctive at this layer. So arteries, small or large, are going to have a thicker wall in relationship to the diameter of their lumen than a similarly uh, sized vein lumen. Again, because of the pressure differences. When we get to arterioles, as I wrote previously, arterioles have only one to two layers. So if I show you a diagram or a um, photograph of an uh, arterial, you see one to two layers, either in longitudinal section or in cross section. That's what I want you to identify it as. There are some images on internet searches on the on the on Google or Yahoo or whatever you use that will identify a blood vessel as arterial when it has four or five. That's not the criteria I'm going by. Okay, so I don't care what they label their particular arterial based on the medical histology classes and stuff that I've taken and taught. We're going to stick with the one to two layers of smooth muscle. I get it has to have some smooth muscle, and the smaller they are, the more numerous they are, and the more effect they're going to have on resistance, and the more effect they're going to have as they change blood pressure. So this diagram illustrates that all the structures have the same layers. But the increase in thickness of the tunica media over the uh, one in the vein. And veins have valves. So the presence of the valves is especially significant when blood is being pumped uphill. All right? Because gravitational force is going to pull it back away from the heart in our upper extremities and lower extremities. And um, it's going to increase the blood pressure force. It has to be at work all the time. So valves work just like they do in the pulmonary uh, and aortic semilunar valves. If pressure is higher on this side, it's going to keep the valves open. As gravity tends to overcome that, they're going to come back and reach the valves and not be able to go any farther backwards. And remember I talked about the skeletal muscle pump? We were talking about increase in venous return. So as you exercise and walk and con uh, contract your muscles, they squeeze on these veins especially the deep veins. Blood's going to be forced in both directions, but it's not going to go very far away from the heart because of the presence of the valve. Okay. Um, you can look at your forearm. If you can see blood vessels, veins in your forearm, you can sometimes, by putting pressure close to the farthest away from the heart and then milking the blood towards your heart and then moving your finger around and playing with that, you can figure out where the valves are. Um, and how close they are together in these veins. Um, a stretching of the vessel wall, either due to weakness or increased pressure, can cause a varicosity where the valves don't close. All right. I have varicose uh, veins, well, veins, in my uh, lower thigh. 
that I created myself, which makes me really upset about it. But after um, my first pregnancy, my husband, you know, I was trying to lose baby fat and so on, and I'd put Chris in the jogger and go out for a run. And my husband had bought some exercise, some bicycle pads. Well, they were padded, but, you know, everybody likes a nice round bottom. So I didn't mind about that. He bought them for a friend, and they were too uh, the wrong size for his friend. So I pulled them on, and I'd go out and run with Chris and the jogger. And one day, about three or four months after he was born, I climbed out of the shower, and our closet doors were double mirrors, and I was driving off, and I saw this dark blue vessel going down the back of my thigh. I was like, where in the world did that come from? And I realized that it ended right at the area of the end of my shorts. And the shorts were lycra shorts, and so they were like a band around my thigh. And as I exercised, what was I doing to Venus return? Increasing it, and then it reached that tight band of lycra material and not be able to go higher and back up and cause a distortion and a separation of the valve, which is what varicosities are. Now, some people have weaker vessels, veins, than others, and so they have a greater tendency to form varicosities. Um, some people hardly ever see them. You can find 70-year-old women out there running, or men, and their legs are really good show vessels. And others, you can see deep vessels through the surface, or uh, superficial vessels through the surface of the skin. And then there's younger people in their 30s and 40s that have varicosities. Typically, uh, these can be uh, fixed. They started to be fixed by stripping. They would make a short incision and pull out. These are superficial veins that we're talking about, okay? Not the deep ones. Superficial veins, they'd strip them out, and the body would create a few more because you have to have the return of the blood. Uh, then they moved to chemical closure where they would inject a caustic chemical that would cause the veins to collapse and when you can't see the blood flowing through you can't see the veins and now typically they use laser treatments to do the same thing. It's usually considered to be cosmetic so insurance won't pay for it. I have a girlfriend who uh, about three years ago had some spider veins and some varicose veins. She had insurance through her work, which paid practically for anything she wanted. Um, it just paid for her to go to a weight loss clinic in Napa Valley for $3,000. And like, I'd like to do that. But she was starting to have a, a little bit of pain over her ankle uh, due to a varicose vein. And so the insurance paid for that. And the doctor said, well, while I'm at it, I'll just Take out all of your varicose veins and take care of your spider veins as well. I'm like, I'm going to have to pay for mine myself. So I started saving up money and then I spent it on the house and now I'm saving up money again. <laughs> uh, so, because it's, it's nice to go out in shorts and new bathing suit in the summer and I just, even though it's behind me, I'm still self conscious about that 10 inches of varicose veins there on the back of my thigh. Um, so, I, you know, I have no idea the cost. What it, whatever it would cost for both. She happened to have it done just before Thanksgiving, and then she invited 20 people over for Thanksgiving dinner. She had both of her lungs wrapped with ace bandages, and every 30 minutes she's lying down to take the pressure off. Yeah, had a Well, I was just going to talk about spider veins. Uh -huh. Are they caused from, like, standing a lot? They can be injuries, so compression injuries or standing. Uh, they're not quite the valve. There's extra vessels in the form uh, to take care of the pressure. So, like... I know that as soon as you get older, you get them, a lot of women do, but what about young, young girls? Um, they can appear in the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, if you get a, some damage that tears vessels, uh, especially can, can cause that. Um, again, some people have weaker vessel walls and valve structures. A few years ago, I read that pansies, you know, there are certain flowers you can, that are edible. Uh, you can put violets or nasturtiums or whatever in salads. And pansies are supposed to have a chemical in them that strengthens vessel wall. I don't know how many cups of pansy flowers you have to eat for this, so I haven't tried it out. Um, but you can buy herbal, you know, herbal supplements and stuff that help to increase that aspect. Um, we have some newer models. 
So we have this uh, model here that shows uh, the structure of uh, veins and arteries, and then the veins open to show the valves. Okay? So it's, it's not very difficult, and then it's just showing the valve structure working back here. Uh, but just a little more three-dimensional component.
Remember the basement membrane, all epithelial tissue has a basement membrane. And so the basement membrane, especially in the fenestrated cells of the kidney, are actually more significant of what is allowed to pass out of the blood than the pores. Something that's large enough to pass through the pores may be too large to pass through the structures of the basement membranes or the slits of the cells forming the kidney. Cells forming our larger sinusoids, the basement membrane is discontinuous. It's not always there. So again, that increases the size of structures and the ease of structures that can pass into or out of the blood vessels. This view over here, if you recall, is just what tight junctions look like.
So it's not just water soluble, but you can just wipe it off with a paper towel rather than using soap and water even. And a couple of things, drawing it on yourself helps you to visualize it. You actually feel the texture of the pen. Um, and then you can look at it and say, okay, it's going here to there or whatever. The gross muscles that you practice using it. So you can do it on a big piece of paper, all right? Um, but doing it on yourself and actually feeling it um, and seeing it helps you visualize where it is. Those of you that had me last semester, I encourage you to draw muscles on yourself uh, for the same reason. And so doing this, you can um, send it to me by a, a file. I will not show it in any other class unless you give me permission to do so. Um, if you feel uncomfortable sending it to me that way, you can just show it to me on your phone, and then I'll put you down for credit, all right? Um, I had a couple of students do it on their small children by putting on t-shirts and a kind of a stocking cap and then drawing on that. Um, I had one dad, I felt a little uncomfortable, he did it on his 10-year-old twin daughters. I was like, oh, that's right at the stage where, so I just deleted that file as soon as he sent it to me, <laughs> unless I gave him the credit for it. Uh, don't shake your dog and draw on your dog. Or <laughs> I did, probably the most interesting <laughs> one I had was a student went to an adult uh, XXX store and bought one of those blow-up dolls uh -huh. and drew it on the doll and then gave me the doll, which I had in my office for a couple of months and then I thought, this is just weird. Uh, so I threw it away. Um, one did it, I prefer it on yourself just because of the, you get the sense of feeling, but one person did it on a, on a baby doll with a bib, and when you show the adult drawings through the frame of valley, with the frame of the valley open and closed by lifting up the bib, and it was drawn in the doll's chest, and then the bib it was <laughs> drawn the other way around. So again, this is not supposedly just to be the extra credit opportunity, but to encourage you to use this method to learn instead of just staring at pictures. Okay. So we're going to start. And we won't um, obviously do, I mean, I have enough time to go through all the blood vessels, but then you guys would be dead. And I want you to have some lab time today, since we don't have lab time tomorrow. So I'm going to go until about 10 o'clock, okay? And then you'll have an hour and a half of lab time. So that's why I'm not taking a break right now. It's a little bit long, but then it'll give you some, so use that lab time. We don't have lab time tomorrow. If you recall from our models, the aorta has a straight segment where it ascends from the heart, then it curves over the left atria and travels down the back of the heart. There are actually four components to the aorta which are described as ascending, arch, and then the descending is divided into thoracic and abdominal. All right. It slightly curves to the left. I'm going to draw it a great degree to the left, just because I want you to be able to see it. So if you look on page 82, 82, a blank page. So as I go through, you can either draw on the paper there or transfer it to that. Um, but I'll try to use the same uh, numbers. So I'm going to use most of this board here. Therefore, I'm going to draw the heart kind of down here like this. And actually even a little lower than that. So coming out of the heart, coming out of the left ventricle, I don't quite draw this yet because I'm going to make erasures. Branches off of the aorta of the heart 
off of the aorta are close down to the ventricle, the left ventricle. A lot of people forget about this. You know, even have textbooks saying the first branch off of the aorta is the brachiocephalic trunk. And they completely forget about the right and left coronary arteries. Those are the first branches off of the aorta. All right? So, one is the right coronary artery. Remember I said you don't have to worry about right or left as far as these blood vessels are concerned unless it has to do with the heart. So right atrium, left atrium, right and left coronary arteries, right and left atrial ventricular valves. After that, you don't have to worry about right and left. Okay? Two is the left coronary artery. We already covered these. So the heart gets first blood branches. However, remember the blood flow doesn't go through the coronary arteries until the heart reaches diastole again. So even though these are the first branches off the heart, they are the last to get blood flowing through them because the semilunar valve leaflets are covering them up until the ventricle relaxes. And then they get their flow with the backflow of blood down the aorta after it's already gone through the rest of the components. This part of the aorta, the first part of the aorta, is known as the ascending aorta. And then this portion here is known as the arch of the aorta, or aortic arch. I'm just in the habit of saying the arch of the aorta, but you can call it the aortic arch. Off the arch of the aorta are three branches. You can see here. Okay. They are asymmetrical. They are going to supply the head and the upper lip. So carotid artery is going to the head. Subclavian artery is going to the upper lip. In fetal development, we had a right common carotid artery and a right subclavian artery. In actuality, what happened um, is, here's the fetal arch, there is a right common, um, a right uh, subclavian, let me start this, take it back a There's a right brachiocephalic trunk with a right common carotid artery and a left subclavian, and a left brachiocephalic trunk, and a left common, and a left subclavian. As the fetal aorta developed, it became in a greater arch in that fashion, so that the left brachiocephalic trunk disappeared, and the common carotid and left subclavian now come directly out of the arch of the aorta. So the first branch off of the arch of the aorta, not the aorta itself, is the brachiocephalic trunk. There's only one, so you don't have to identify it as right or left anyway. And it's about three inches long, three to four inches long. That's what you're seeing right here. Because this is a side view of this individual. So we're not seeing the left side and we're seeing the brachiocephalic trunk. The brachiocephalic trunk gives off a branch that goes out the right side of the neck, and a branch that goes over the right shoulder. common carotid. Again, you're welcome to just call it carotid artery. And it's going to divide common. Whenever we see the word common, it means we're going to have an internal and external branching from it. So if you look here at the diagram, internal carotid artery 
stays internal and enters the carotid canal. We talked about that with the skull in vial 430. It's one of two pairs of vessels that, belong, that supplies oxygenated blood to the brain. The external actually becomes more medial, travels up the side of the neck, and supplies blood to structures of the neck, like the larynx and the thyroid gland, and onto the front side of the face and back of the head. Okay. So uh, we're going to come back and look at these in, large, in a different format, otherwise I'd be drawing on the board. So here we have seven and eight. Seven going medial is the external carotid artery. And eight is internal. So I'm going to leave that there for a moment. I drew that even farther, too high, farther than I wanted. So rather than, um, well, if you guys have room. I'm going to bring all of this down. So I'll redraw it. Don't worry about it. I'm going to bring it farther down. straight up. Okay. So it's more, this one that's going, it's going towards the face, so that's why I have it uh, going in that direction right here. Alright. So now it gives off, we're going to look at branches of external carotid artery. So you can see them here. There's actually one that's missing that comes down to the thyroid. One that we're not going to worry about goes to the tongue. Another one goes to the exit to the back of the skull. We don't worry about that one either. So, coming down towards the thyroid gland, we have superior thyroid. And we're going to have the occipital that we're not going to worry about. And as it goes up, we're going to skip the lingual. And we have facial and middle meningeal. And then we end by forming superficial temporal. And I'll show those to you in just a moment. All right. So, nine, the superior thyroid, ten is facial, 11 is maxillary, and these are superficial temporal. Oh, sorry. So coming off of external carotid, we have superior thyroid, the occipital one I didn't name, 10 is facial, 
I'll show you these in just a moment. Eleven is maxillary. Sorry. My number is off. I'm sorry. Eleven is maxillary. A branch off of eleven is middle meningeal, which you guys should be familiar with if you took file 430 from me. And then 13 is superficial temporal. Let's look at it on the diagram, and I'll show it to you on some models, right? So again, here is external. It's external all the way up here until it ends as superficial temporal. It gives off superior thyroid, which you can't see here. Facial, when we do pulse next week, I'm going to ask you to find your facial artery pulse. It forms a highly tortuous path across your face as it goes towards your nose. And there's a lack of muscle over this region of the mandible. So if you place a couple of fingers lightly, if you feel there, you can kind of feel a dent where the muscle is, is absent or thinner. And you can feel against the bone your facial artery. If we look at a model, this is the facial artery right here. You can see how torturous it is as it goes across the face and then up the side of the nose. Up here, on the side of the temporalis muscle, we have the superficial temporal artery. All right. Maxillary artery, actually, you would think it would be called mandible because it back goes behind the mandible, but it actually goes under the maxilla. So this is the maxillary artery here that you can see behind the mandible. And it gives off a branch that passes through the, um, you can see it on this model. You can see the maxillary on this one. Put it down here. And you can also see the maxillary artery on at least one of these skull bottles. We looked at these last semester when we looked at the vessels inside the skull. Alright, so right here is external carotid. It's not showing the facial, but coming right through here is maxillary. And if you look inside, you can see the middle meningeal going along the side of the temporal bone. It supplies the meninges in the inside of the skull. I talked about a fracture of the temporal bone last semester, uh, a baseball bat goes through the, the thin portion, a baseball throw through the thin portion, thin portion of the temporal bone, tearing these meningeal arteries and resulting in a hemorrhage inside the bone tissue. This one shows the, next, the facial artery right here. And then if the maxillary artery is, it should be behind the mandible. And then you can also take off the top and look inside. Anybody remember the opening in the skull of the sphenoid bone that the middle meningeal artery passes through? Oh, God. I know, you had a hard time remembering that just for the exam. It formed the exclamation point behind foramen ovale. Foramen rotunda? No, foramen rotunda was here. And then foramen ovale was here. There's a tiny little one right there. Spinosum? Spinosum. Excellent. You get the candy bar today. So foramen spinosum is where this middle meningeal artery passes into the skull to supply not the brain tissue, but the meninges in the inside of the skull. Right? And then superficial temporal vessel on the top. None of that goes to the actual brain, okay? Brain tissue, nerve tissue, gets its blood supply via the internal carotid artery. So before we look at that, and we covered this in Bio 430, I don't know if other classes did or not covered blood supply to the brain, so I'll go slow in case you didn't. But remember I said there were two pairs of blood vessels that provide blood supply to the brain, primarily internal carotid artery. The other one, as you can see here, comes off of the subclavian and goes up through the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebra, passes through the foramen magnum, 
and enters with the brain at the brain stem level. All right, so that's the other source. Now, before I look at that, let me label the branches of the uh, it's way down at the bottom, so I'm just going to write these in as 25 and 26. So this is going to be left common carotid. which comes off as the second branch of the arch of the aorta and left the clavian. Left common carotid artery is going to do the same thing as the right common carotid artery. So the only difference is the intermediate brachiocephalic trunk. So let's do the subclavian branches here, and then we'll follow the vertebral arteries up. So there are three structures here that are branches of the subclavian that I want you to know. The first one is vertebral artery. This is pretty small. It's less than the diameter of a pencil. Not the lead, but the pencil itself, because it has to pass through those transverse foramina. So this is passing through the cervical vertebra. So it is the vertebral artery, and this is subclavian. What was the number for subclavian? Right, subclavian. Fourteen. This is eventually going to end up in the upper extremity. Oh, well, you're not leaving them left and right, right. Not anymore. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then vertebral would be fifteen. And then just distal, a little farther away from the heart, we have a short vessel that then gives off a great variety, actually seven different vessels, that go to the neck and go to the shoulder area. And so this is known as the thyrocervical trunk. Is that 16? Yes. yes. I want you to know off of the thyrocervical trunk is another blood supply to the thyroid artery. So we had superior thyroid artery, and then from here we have inferior thyroid artery. Remember the thyroid gland is a endocrine organ, so it needs a lot of blood supply and blood drainage. So that would be 17. And then we'll. So if we look at this model of the thyroid gland, so here's our voice box. Here's the thyroid gland. This blood vessel coming down the side here is the superior thyroid artery. All right, number nine on the diagram up there, the, one of the early branches off of the external carotid. And the inferior thyroid artery is going to be coming over from kind of right here, crossing over into the neck. We have a large blood, amount of blood supply carrying oxygen to the thyroid gland. Now it's going to be a look till tomorrow before we talk about this next vessel. But that's the internal thoracic artery. It should be 18. The significance of the internal thoracic artery is that it gives rise to the blood vessels that supply the front of the chest wall. So this is the internal view of what we know as the breastplate. So here's the inside, the side of your sternum. Here's the internal thoracic artery on the left side of the chest, equal on both sides. 
and you can see coming off of it in between the ribs are the internal intercostal arteries. All right. So these are going to come off the front to supply the front of the chest. Coming off the aorta in the back, we have the posterior intercostals that they meet and join in the middle. We have a continuous loop around each side. But we'll come back to that tomorrow. I know I said I would stop at 10, but I want to do blood supply to the brain. So this is what up so you can view on head and neck. It's to meet you at a coffee shop or to come to your house to study. And you were to draw out a map. You probably are not going to draw out both sides of the road. You probably just draw a line and say, turn here, turn here. And as you're drawing that line, I bet every single one of you is visualizing what that route looks like. And when you turn left, you're seeing the park or the gas station or the library or whatever. And then you turn right at this stop sign. You're not just seeing the road, you're seeing the structures around it. And so that's the way I want you to approach learning these blood vessels. All right. So many of them are identified by the organ that they supply or the structure they're passing through. So on the right side of the forearm, we have radial artery. On the left side, we have ulnar artery. If it's going to the stomach, it's called the gastric artery. If it's going to the liver, it's called the hepatic artery. All right. So as you learn these pathways, then we're going to start learning so what vessels would you travel to to get to the brain. So as we look on the diagram, if we're going to the right side of the brain, we would go up the ascending aorta to the aortic arch. Then we'd take the right brachycephalic trunk, the right common carotid artery, the internal carotid artery, and would be in the brain. So those sequential lists. So I have some practice ones up on D2L, both going to and coming from different organs as we add to this database. And that's your extra credit for this unit, is filling in pathways. So there will be two choices. Trace a drop of blood from the bottom of the foot to the top of the brain. Just making something up. So from, you'd have to use veins to get back to the heart. You don't have to go through the pulmonary system. And then arteries to get to the top of the brain. Right? So I gave you two choices. And you can choose either one that you feel the most comfortable with. And there's usually about 13 or 14 blanks worth half a point each. So there are practice ones online. Obviously, we haven't done veins yet, so it would be a little more difficult to do that. But it's just like drawing a map show somebody how to get somewhere. May I raise the boards? You guys have that? All right. For instance, what I just said, trace a drop of blood from the heart to the right side of the brain. The reason it makes a difference is because if you use the left side of the brain, you wouldn't be going through a brachycephalic trunk. You would just be going directly through the left common carotid. So here's what I mean by drawing a line. You don't have to do the double. Here's the aorta, ascending aorta, arch of the aorta, brachycephalic trunk, common carotid artery, subclavian, internal carotid artery, external carotid artery, superior thyroid, facial, uh, maxillary, uh, um, middle meningeal, superficial temporal, vertebral, internal thoracic, thyrocervical trunk, left common carotid, left subclavian, descending aorta, intercostals, subclavian, axillary, brachial, radial, ulnar. So as you do that, do it. I have done this in the sand of the dirt of the Great Smoky Mountains. <laughs> Out hiking, I ran into a student that said, could you explain this to me? I sat down and touched the dirt. <laughs> Seriously? I'm Seriously. Wow. Wow. Now, it's a little cold. Snow's deep. There's a ton of beach at Folsom Lake that might be a little cold to go there this weekend. All right? So draw on yourself. People might think you're a little weird out there drawing lines on yourself or in the sand. Um, but you can just doodle. So on a piece of paper, you can sit there and start, okay, I'm going to diagram a blood supply to the hand. I'm going to diagram the blood supply to the brain. I'm going to diagram the blood supply to the stomach. And you can just do these lines. When you get your exam, 
You could do the whole body in a few minutes. And then when I have a question, the brachiocephalic trunk divides to form which of the following vessels. All you have to do is look at your picture and name the vessels. Okay. Which of the following vessels supplies blood to the liver? Look at your picture, name it. And that way you have all that information down on a piece of paper. And each time you have a question, you don't have to re-figure it out in your head. So as you diagram these, it's like drawing a map to your house over and over. And pretty soon you can drive it in your sleep. Okay? So do these in sections. Don't try to learn the entire body. And remember, they're named for the parts of the body that they supply. And most of the veins have the same name as the arteries. Okay. So briefly now, let's look at the blood supply to the brain. You have me last semester, you can fall asleep. Or you can use it as a review. A little difficult to draw the blood supply to the brain on yourself. But remember, you can look inside. These models are excellent. Because sometimes the three-dimensional aspect of it is difficult. What I'm drawing is what you're seeing here on the inside of the skull. Alright, so you can use those for reference. Some of you actually may have done a case study last semester on this when we had the uh, blood clots, a stroke. So remember, two sets of vessels carry blood to the brain. Most of the blood is carried by the internal carotid arteries. Now, instead of looking down inside the skull, we're looking at the base of the brain as if we were looking at it like this. The other set of vessels are the paravertebral arteries that are coming in through the foramen magnum. Again, if that doesn't make sense, look at the skull models. All right, to visualize that aspect. So we're going to start with the vertebral arteries. I think I have those lettered on the diagram, so I'll just label them here. They're coming up through the foramen magnum. From the left side and the right side. And they join, there's two vertebral arteries on the medulla. And then they join together on the pons to form a single vessel. Let me draw this over here. So we have vertebral arteries that are supplying the medulla. We're not going to worry about the pipas, okay? So we'll just stick with vertebral artery. Now, do you remember what the pregnant belly of the pons is called? Or sorry guys, the beer belly? We called it the, starts with a B? Basal pons? Oh, basal pons. Alright, so this single vessel, here's the two vertebral arteries on the medulla. Alright, the basal pons has just one vessel, basal or artery. Two vertebral arteries from the medulla join to form a single basal artery over the swollen basal pond and then end by forming two branches. So pass a blood posterior to the cerebellum. And what's the what's the posterior lobe of the brain? Occipital lobe. All right. So these two branches are known as the posterior cerebral arteries. And there, so this is going to pons and vertebral arteries are going to medulla. Posterior cerebral arteries are going to cerebellum. and occipital lobe. And 
So that's what you see right here. Not the first set, but the last set right here. And you can see them passing posteriorly, supply the occipital lobe, and the cerebellum. Okay. Branches of the medulla and base where it can go to the cerebellum as well. So that's the, that's the supply from the vertebral arteries. Then we have the internal carotid arteries coming up through the carotid canal, and they bend forward. And so we're going to show them cut right here, because obviously they're separated from the internal carotid canal. And they have a major branch that passes through the lateral sulcus. You guys remember the lateral sulcus? I'll show it to you on the brain in just a moment. So these are the internal carotid arteries right here. And the posterior cerebrals are connected to them by small vessels that now connect the carotid system with the vertebral system. We'll talk about the significance of that in just a moment. So these are called posterior communicating arteries. And they connect carotid and vertebral. So the posterior, the little guys. These two right here. Okay. So these two right here. The, the internal carotid artery has two branches, two major branches. This one right here that's passing through the lateral sulcus is known as the middle cerebral artery. It's the largest and has the greatest amount of brain tissue that it supplies. And it's going to do the lateral aspect of frontal, parietal, temporal, lobes, and the insula. Mm -hmm. So if we look at brain tissue, we're almost done here for those of you that are getting a little overwhelmed. So these models show, have a plastic extra piece that shows the vertebral arteries and the basal artery. And the posterior cerebral, internal carotid arteries are cut right here. But notice in this whole brain, all the blood vessels that are on the surface, all of this area here is formed by branches of middle cerebral. Just the, post, the occipital lobe here is done by posterior cerebral. If I remove the temporal lobe, here is the middle cerebral artery coming through. The lateral sulcus is on the surface of the insula right here, and it comes out to supply all this outer surface of the brain. So that's middle cerebral artery. Any blood clots or strokes usually involve some branch of the middle cerebral, certainly if it involves speech. So you're seeing the middle cerebral right here, going through the lateral sulcus and onto the lobes. It has a smaller branch, the internal carotid arteries have a smaller branch that passes forward through the longitudinal fissure between each hemisphere. That's what we see right here. It's going to, these two vessels are going to pass over the corpus callosum go backwards, kind of like a cockroach's antenna, and supply the inside medial surface of the brain. So these are identified as anterior cerebral arteries. They're going to supply the medial surface of the frontal lobe, right below and 
tympanal lobe. Not the occipital lobe because that's still posterior cerebral artery. So now if I separate the brain into two hemispheres, here's the corpus callosum. So this is the anterior cerebral artery right here. It follows the shape of the corpus callosum and supplies this surface right here. And actually about onto that much of the top of the brain. So in my class, we talked about cingulate gyrus. That's right here, just above corpus callosum. All of that's going to be done by anterior cerebral artery. So passing inside the longitudinal fissure and towards over the corpus callosum. We have one small branch that connects the two anterior cerebrals. And this is known as the anterior communicating artery. So we have three sets of cerebrals. Anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, and posterior. Whoops, wrong side. Posterior cerebral. So you should know what part of the brain each of those supplies. As far as the lecture. Type question is concerned. The purpose of the communicating arteries is to connect the carotid system with the vertebral system. So if we have a block, say in the internal carotid artery on the right side, and we're no longer getting blood up through the right carotid artery, blood can flow from the vertebral artery through the posterior communicating and get out to the right side of the brain. All right. So the communicating that connect the two systems, vertebral and carotid, and the anterior communicating connects left to right side. So this is an anastomosis. Remember how I talked about the heart didn't have an anastomosis? This would be not a true anastomosis as far as the ends of the arteries are connected, but at least an anastomosis where we have vessels connected that can overcome a block. So it's called a cerebral circuit. The old name is Circle of Willis uh, because it can, forms this circle at the, the base of the brain. So this just shows um, a view. Here's the vertebral arteries on the base of a real human brain. The base of artery, posterior cerebral that's communicating. The internal carotid artery coming in here and middle cerebral artery going out, the two anterior cerebrals. Right. So we'll stop here. No more new material. I know we've covered quite a bit. I'm uh, trying to make a little bit. So for those of you that came in late, I'll mention it again if you're not set up on uh, D2L. Tuesday, I will be at the coroner's office, so we won't be having class on Tuesday. We we'll have the opportunity to come to Open Lab tomorrow after the lecture or on Monday, um, you can use that time to offer to study your model. No suit, no time for Tuesday at all. So for lab, we have the skull to study, we have the brain to study, there's the torso, um, we also have what are called the circulatory trees over here, they're a little intimidating uh, because of all the wires sticking out. I, really, I stick to the closed branches. I don't go way out here where wires are just hanging in space. I'd like you to be able to see the vessel in relationship to what it supplies. Um, but as far as the aorta and its first major branches, uh, the intercostal coming off the internal thoracic, you can see those components on it. You can also find this online if you look up cardiovascular tree. Um, or circulatory tree, there are images of the, this online as well. So there are our microscope slides. I will pull out for looking at arteries in vein. Uh, some are labeled artery in vein, and some are going to just be from the small intestine, where you can find cross sections of arterial capillary. I have practice identifying those.
Cardiac output, though, is what we're learning right now. Well, I thought this was the blood. I don't know. I don't know. Just take it. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah, but, uh, I really got confused on this lab. It wasn't very straightforward. I'm going to head over It wasn't. I didn't. The two mechanisms for to overcome vagal stimulation was the sympathetic reflexes and the working G fibers. Mm -hmm. it's, it's two different things, right? Yes. Okay. Working fibers are part of the uh, autonomic cells. Rhythmic cells. Professor? Yes. The online quiz that's due tomorrow, it says cardiac physiology and cardiac output. What you, is this car considered cardiac output? So we should have everything. What I finished on lecture Tuesday. Okay. And then another question? We have two quizzes next week. That's what I'm going to go on today and adjust. Okay. Yeah, the two lab quizzes. You could always just drop one entirely or give us all tens. I think you should get all tens on that. Without even learning the material? No, no. Oh, no, no the material. Learning the material. <laughs> I could make it online. No. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Boom, hiss, I say. I don't like it. I think I'm looking at it. So what's your question? The first one is just because it just shows the depolarization of ventricles, right? Um, it's the force is greater on the ventricles. Because when um, we stimulated it, it sometimes got higher, so it increased the QRS wave. Mm -hmm. 
So in rotting of the cerebral circuit, I might put in there posterior cerebral. So that you would know, oh, I have to go up the vertebral. I put for number